Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. And let me welcome you to another episode of the Daily Friend Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer. And today I'm joined by uh, two gentlemen whose office used to bear the name the Ministry of Truth. That is Marius Root. Marius, how are you? Hello, Nick. Hope you're well. I am. I am. And Mr. Terence Corrigan. Terence, how are you? Uh, otherwise known as the Truth Fairy. Yes, no good, Nick. <laughs> Well, I think I think there has been some vindication, perhaps, for the truth fairies. Um, <laughs> those who follow the show on a day by day basis know that we talked about uh, recently about about comments made by the Health Professions Council of South Africa, their their uh, president, basically saying that all na uh, medical insurance funds should be nationalised. Um, this is something that IRR, the Institute of Race Relations, has been warning about for a while. That this is kind of the end logic of, of, of the, these, these proposals that government is looking at um, and that many businesses seem to have been under the impression that they would be co-opted into the system uh, and, and, and left to, to, to rot uh, or left to, left to prosper in their own sort of sorted way. <laughs> um, but, but uh, I think it's Rob Rose uh, wrote a opinion piece today in Business Live uh, asking the question, will South Africa's medical, and I'm quoting from it here, will South Africa's medical aid reserves be expropriated to fund the country's bankrupt plan for the national health insurance? Until a week ago, you'd imagine this to be a nuts conspiracy theory cooked up by a sect in the basement of the Institute of Race Relations. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> I'm not going to say we told you so. <laughs> um, but we told you so. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I also would like to point out there was uh, a comment actually under that article uh, where someone called Mr. Speedy, um, which is an interesting <laughs> name to comment under, said, so finally the private sector is waking up to the fact that the IRR are not a bunch of right-wing nutcases that have been predicting the destructive, uh, that, that have been falsely predicting the destructive course of the ANC. Uh, so anyway, he goes on in this article to say various things, but one of the things he talks about, he quotes the CEO of Discovery, um, who told the Financial Mail that uh, the nationalization of, of medical ins insurance, uh, private medical insurance schemes is, quote, a preposterous proposal akin to the idea of subtly nationalizing all private pension funds. We wouldn't accept that and society wouldn't accept that. To simply nationalize medical aid members' money, which they contributed on discretion out of their after-tax income would not only be unconstitutional, it would be tantamount to taking money out of their bank account. Oh boy, how I think he's revealed perhaps much about his naivete here. <laughs> um, he, he may, he may, if he if he read the Daily Friend and listened to the Daily Friend podcast, he would know As that should. the government has also mulled uh, uh, taking pension funds through prescribed assets. But let me stop filibustering and go on to you, Terence, uh, for your thoughts. Um, can we really trust Discovery or any major? Um, health insurance company to hold the line firmly on the destruction of their businesses by NHI? Well, look, uh, speaking as the uh, great high priest of, uh, of the, the, the property rights sect, um, I've been warning about this for years, and I don't know how many journalists I have corrected when they've said they want to talk to me about land expropriation without compensation, and I say, please take that land off. This is about property. Property is not limited to land. That's in the Constitution. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to, to, to see this. You just have to read what is in the Constitution. Um, yes, and I, uh, through my evangelism, have encountered many people who have denounced me as a heretic um, and have, uh, you know, accused me of spreading false doctrines which contradict the, uh, uh, the law of the new dawn. Um, and yes, you know, I, but I, I do think that uh, uh, that we have been shown to be the ones who actually saw where the, um, uh, where the true light was in this. Um, look, else we can, uh, 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 can, we, can we trust Discovery? Uh, or for that matter, any of these, um, uh, uh, any of these insurance or, 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 or medical aid firms? I think the, pro uh, the problem is that business functions with a particular mindset. It's quite pragmatic and it assumes that things are um, are rationally connected to goals which they identify as rational. You want economic growth, you want high care, health care, whatever. 
they fail to understand, and I think sometimes willfully so, the baleful influence of ideology on government uh, on, on on government action. So yes, you know, having the national health insurance is a statement about um, uh, about socioeconomic inclusion. The fact that it may not work is kind of secondary. Um, there is almost a cathartic thing to uh, destroying the the uh, uh, the dread hand of um, of the market and the profit motive. Um, now, this of course will not apply to the uh, uh, to those in the upper reaches of our society. Um, Sadly, there's precedent all over the world for elites to uh, mismanage their countries, but you know, be able to uh, go elsewhere for um, uh, for the care they require, or to do it within the country, for instance, in military hospitals or whatever. But um, you know, um, how exactly will um, uh, will these institutions push back on this? Um, by having a, um, a quiet chat where they get a, a general non-binding assurance that everyone's opinions will be considered, which, see, which is the response we've been given uh, as to why they, um, they're not ready for a conversation yet because you know, there's a public participation process. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they are speaking to the minister. Um, you know, they may be speaking to the minister, but perhaps the minister doesn't respect them. Perhaps the minister speaks to them because that is what the minister does as part of as, as part of his strategy. Um, will they resist uh, through the law and the and the constitution? Um, well, you know, after we finish these processes of, of constitutional amendments, I think, and uh, and expropriation legislation, I think that I think those tools will be significantly degraded. Um, and I think that's the point of the, um, uh, that's the point of them. And for those who thought this was all going to be about um, about pharma fundamental and the free state, well, you know, I did try to warn you. Um, you know, perhaps it becomes a case of uh, well, you know, this is uh, uh, this is a moral fight. But let's remember that, uh, that 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 certain medical aides refuse to stand up for the um, uh, for their members over issues of um, of vaccines. No, no, no. They were going to they were going to defer to the government because we needed social solidarity. Well, you know, if I just wargaming this from from the government side, I could turn around and say, well, you know, where is the social solidarity in not being willing to hand over these vast resources? You know, are you are you motivated by the profit motive or something like that? You know, um, trying to trying to play a game with somebody who views those rules very differently is often a very fraught prospect. And I think this may have, this may just be the um, uh, uh, be if I may put it this way the baptism of fire that business have tried to avoid. Definitely. As for the the uh, the influence of ideology, I recommend any major decision makers or any interested citizens in South Africa to go and listen to ANC and EFF parliamentary speeches. They are so they don't exactly translate into what the ANC's legislative agenda is going to be. But they are very clear upon the terms by which they see the world, that uh, white monopoly capital is a, a dangerous force that is destroying and sabotaging society, South African society from within, that business is the enemy, that capital mm. is at war with the government. These are yes. not fringe views in the government. These are the ANC's views. Yes. But, um, Morris, your thoughts on this? Do you agree uh, with Terence that uh, we can't expect much from from big business based on uh, the, our historical experience um, to stand up to this stuff? Or do you think that maybe the, the, the something is beginning to dawn? Not Ramaphosa's new dawn, but uh, the new <laughs> the dawn of <laughs> the death of property rights in South Africa. Is is this maybe waking up business? Do you think? Ah, uh, we'll see. I mean, as uh, as you point out, uh, there's lots of historical precedent for this in South Africa. There's always been kind of an unholy alliance between big business and big government. I mean, this goes back to apartheid. And only, I mean, business played a big role in ending apartheid, but it only really came to the party when uh, apartheid was, you know, kind of damaging the profits that uh, businesses could make. And uh, like I said, they played a big role, but there was also a self interest role in ending apartheid. And I think we've seen the same thing here. Lots of big businesses haven't pushed back against really bad policy. A lot of big businesses are happy with uh, implementing things like growth-based black economic empowerment because for them, the extra uh, regulations they have to uh, 
uh, you know, comply with and the hoops they have to jump through. For them, that's that's fine. They can go uh, employ somebody to do all that for them. But smaller business is a bit more difficult. Same with the bargaining councils and sector-wide agreements. That's fine for the bigger businesses to agree to, you know, Kusata's wage demands. It's a bit, uh, a bit more difficult for, you know, your 10 or 20-man business, you know, to comply with these demands. And it kind of, uh, you know, squashes the little guy. And we've seen, I mean, and this isn't actually a South African phenomenon. We've seen it around the world where big businesses push out smaller competitors. But uh, just talking about Adrian Gore, uh, I mean, you know, this is this could just be uh, a coincidence, but two weeks ago, uh, the founder of uh, Discovery, Adrian Gore, and uh, uh, another founder, Barry Schwarzberg, between them uh, sold 70 million rands worth of Discovery shares. So according to them, it's only 1% of the total shares in the company, but it's <laughs> the, the timing is fairly interesting. So you've got to ask yourself, why, you know, why are they deciding to sell these shares now? And um, yeah, I think uh, Discovery, they seem to be kind of trying to feed the crocodile. Uh, I think ProfMed has been the only kind of uh, medical uh, aid uh, or insurance company that I've seen that's really trying to stand up for its members. They were the only ones who said at the beginning, their members' um, uh, contributions will not be used to fund vaccines for non-members, which we can talk about the social solidarity aspect, which is all fine. But you've got to remember this, uh, people's mem uh, membership contributions belong to the member uh, concerned. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to uh, the medical aid. Same as uh, the prescribed assets issue. I was just before looking at some uh, articles about when prescribed assets was, uh, you know, really in public consciousness last year. And I mean, for me, this is a mind boggling headline. It's the Mail and Guardian. And this is after a conference where Martin Kingston of, I think, uh, Business for South Africa spoke, Kusatu, people from government. The headline says, all agree, use pension funds. So who, who, who are all these people agreeing? Have they asked every member of a pension fund saying, do you mind your money being used to bail out ESCOM or to go build bridges and for infrastructure spend? I'm sure most people say no. I mean, in, and pension funds have a duty, same as medical aids, to use their members' contributions to for their members' benefit, not for the government's benefits, not for people who are non-members. And uh, that, that all said, people have already made their social solidarity contribution through their taxes. Most South Africans don't mind paying taxes, I don't think, but they want those taxes to be used properly, to be, you know, not, not to be stolen, not to be used wastefully. And I think it's it really tells you something about the mindset of the government, that they are looking at people's, the contributions people have made from their after-tax income to whether it be a medical aid, whether it be a pension fund, whatever the case is, now the government has their eyes on it. And uh, this uh, fellow from the Health Professionals Council uh, who said, uh, you know, we need to use these medical aid uh, contributions, these, these need to belong to the government. They, those are South Africans, ordinary South Africans' contributions that they've saved and put away. These do not belong to the government. And I mean, the, the guy from the HPCSA is obviously not a government official, but it probably shows you that uh, uh, it's not too far from thinking of at least some people within the government who don't see this money as belonging to individuals. Even if they do, they believe that they are entitled to it some way. And it tells you something a lot about the mindset in the government. And I think, as you say, it's a, uh, the, how ideology drives what a lot happens in South Africa. Definitely. Um, I, I just want to once again talk about how this linkage between expropriation without compensation and um, and something like this, like the nationalizing of health insurance, as Terence points out, you know, the way the property is defined in the constitution and in the in the legislation is to include everything, not just land. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a sort of deer in the headlights kind of feeling when you read these these, these articles here. So uh, the 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 guy the the president of the um, Healthcare uh, Health Professionals Council of South Africa was asked by Financial Mail, you know, what, uh, how could such a fundamental change to the structure of medical schemes uh, be made constitutionally? And they, they said that he replied very vaguely. He said, "We're saying if we want universal healthcare to happen, there will be have to be changes to benefit the many, not the few." But it's as though they don't see, you know, what's right right behind them there, which is. The change to the constitution, which, as Gabriel says, will drag a steak knife across the Bill of Rights in South Africa, especially the the uh, right to property. Terence, final thoughts? No, uh, 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 not much to add. You know, I, I remember having a having a private conversation some years ago with somebody who, I would say, is sort of, uh, on the on the left wing of politics, kind of natural ANC voter if the ANC wasn't corrupt and useless, and. Um, you know, he uh, he was uh, very concerned about the, about the prospects of, uh, for his pension, 
and I said, you know, you say hands off your pension. The government does not ideologically see this as your asset. It sees this as part of a national asset. Uh, so, um, you know, that that is that is fundamentally what we um, uh, uh, what we're facing. It's a very you, in order to understand this, you have to you have to go through you have to go through a particular looking glass. Yeah, so definitely check out uh, Parliament um, when they're in session and go and listen to a few ANC and EFF speeches. And I think uh, one's understanding of ideology will be greatly, greatly enhanced. But um, I just want to say I quite like the fact that people like Rob Rose are, I don't know if we can call it being institute pulled, perhaps. And uh, there's, um, I'd just like to read out a tweet from Feral Huffaji, who, uh, oh, who yes. once called me a, a weasel on Twitter, but uh, that's besides the point. So she tweeted, <laughs> this is from uh, 26th May, so this is yesterday. So the NHR draft law gives uber power to the Minister of Health, who chairs a board, which gets to decide how roughly 400 billion rand is spent every year. Can you just imagine? Then three eye emojis four roll, uh, roll eyes emojis. So I just want to ask Farrell, I mean, you, you'd think she's somebody who's, I mean, she's, you know, a well-known person in the media. She's a journalist. She was editor of the Mail and Garden, worked at uh, Bloomberg, now at the Daily America, I believe. Has she has she not been reading what the NHR, what the plans for the NHR have been for, since it's uh, first started getting mooted, I think about a decade ago, if, if not even before that? What what does what she, <laughs> what did she think what is going to happen? Want... Yeah, what did they think it was going to do? Did they think it was just going to give, I don't know, puppies and kittens to the whole country? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. You know, make uh, ecstasy free for everybody so everybody has a good time or something. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah but no, it's, it's all a party. It's, exactly, but it's it's completely bonkers. But also, I mean, it would be very interesting who... I'd love to know who these people are going to vote for in um, hmm. in October or the, in the next national election. You know, I mean, we can... We can uh, say we don't want to vote for the DA because they had a cringy uh, uh, virtual congress, what the case is. But, I mean, they're not planning on stealing, uh, you know, and uh, making 400 billion, billion rand fund, which is under the control of literally one person. Or, you know, the EFF who, you know, is uh, uh, basically maybe two weeks away from calling for the genocide of, uh, you know, white or Indians in South Africa, whatever the case is. So, yeah, but, I mean, it's I think uh, we're, uh, this is probably a different discussion, but uh, the DA definitely gets held to a... Uh, much higher standard than most other political parties in South Africa, but uh, that also said they also don't do themselves uh, any favors often. Yeah, no, it's uh, a. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see the pretzels that some of the the well-meaning intelligentsia twist themselves into mm -hmm. um, to justify their their political outlook in the in the next election. Anyway, um, let's move on to another story concerning South Africa, and that is, of course, a report by the World Bank on our ports. So uh, the, the World Bank looked at hundreds of ports around the world uh, and their efficiency in receiving cargo and, uh, and basically being able to process ships and turn them around. And they found that the best port in South Africa, uh, and uh, just a reminder for our listeners, ports are all run by national government. Uh, this is Transnet. I think it's the, it's the department that's responsible for running them. So they also run the, the, the railways and such. Um, Transne uh, they found that Cape Town's port is the best, but even Cape Town's port was 347th out of 351 ports, falling behind container ports in places well known for their efficiency and, and, and prosperity, such as Djibouti, uh, Maputo, Wolvis Bay, Dar es Salaam, and Mombasa. The uh, Western Cape government, the, the DA Western Cape government, has been very uh, uh, critical of government's plans. I think we talked recently on the show about government plans to uh, invest in enormous amounts of money into Durban Harbour, um, which this report would seem to justify, right, because it's, it performs so badly. Uh, but the Western Cape claims that as the best port, it should have uh, uh, money spent on it as well, not just on not just on Durban. Um, uh, the, the David Mania from the Western Cape government pointed out that there have been more than 5,000 incidents of equipment breaking down in the last financial year at the Cape Town port. This is the equivalent of 14 breakdowns per day, most of which he says are caused by equipment reaching its lifespan. Um, and then he went on to say that uh, getting efficient ports would allow us to export more, which would be good for uh, the province's economy and the country's economy. Uh, so, Marius, what's your take on this? Um, what, how how did we get to a state where you know South Africa's ports are behind Djibouti, Maputo, and Dar es Salaam? I mean, 
those are not exactly well-run places, and yet we seem to be less efficient in them. Uh, I think it's usual story in South Africa. It's South African it's neglect from the government, coupled with South African mediocrity. You know, accepting you know, poor, poor outcomes. And uh, South Africans, we I think we often we have sort of a uh, we think there's a South African exceptionalism. And I think uh, perhaps in the early nineties there was uh, probably we we uh, we were justified in saying that with we managed to come out of apartheid with uh, all things considered uh, a fairly low amount of bloodshed. I mean, of course, uh, lots of people were killed and so on in, in the unrest around the end of apartheid. But I think compared to what was happening in the world at the time with the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, which was the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II, the genocide in Rwanda, uh, which we all know the terrible things that happened there, you know, unrest in places like Somalia and so on. I think overall South Africa it was, I mean, they talk about the miracle and I think it's, you know, it's not too far off to say it was a miracle, but I think South Africa since then, we haven't done anything to really justify this exceptionalism. We seem to think that the world kind of owes us something. We think that people just come and invest in South Africa because we're South Africa. So we can let uh, our ports fall apart. We can let roads not be maintained. We can run a, uh, an airline for money, an airline which where money could be far better, would do, uh, you know, do much better work in uh, other parts of the economy. So I think this is all just part of it. I think this is, you know, the usual South African story, government neglect and uh, not really actually caring, uh, coupled with uh, South African mediocrity and a belief that the world owes us something. And we've seen now it's what's happened. I mean, as you say, we rank uh, below places that are well known for the efficiency and good governance, such as Barra in Mozambique, which is about 200 kilometers away from a massive jihadist insurgency now. And it's still a better port than Cape Town. So, yeah, and the, I mean, as you say, this is not a, the Cape Town still uh, ranked higher than Durban and Kura, uh, things like the port in Altfad uh, Gereba, well, obviously old uh, Port Elizabeth. But yeah, this tells us a lot about uh, the attitude of the South African government to infrastructure. And we can, you know, the government can have as many uh, talk shops and commissions and, you know, roadshows as once, but it's, uh, at some point it's got to, come to the party and roll, it, roll up its sleeves and also get the private sector involved it needs to. And that seems to be, that's the only way things seem to work in South Africa is if the private sector has at least some involvement. Right, right. Um, so, Terence, one of the things I, I, I thought of when I read about this is, I think possibly uh, part of what's going on here is actually the influence of South Africa's unions, um, which do still hold quite a big influence i think over over something like ports and a lot of infrastructure um and that might explain why you know a country like mozambique can have more efficient systems because in those countries you know no one really has firmly protected rights not workers not property owners not anyone really um and so uh, you know unions don't have the power to disrupt or to create this sort of culture of um what's the word i'm looking for uh i don't know the lack of care, basically, uh, mm. is, is what I'm trying to say. Am I, am I being crazy? Am I being a, a, a mad right-wing uh, free marketeer? Or, or what's what's your view on this? No, look, I think that that um, uh, so South Africa's infrastructure, uh, um, you know, it, it's something that that you um, that that you see in both popular and uh, academic commentary from time to time. That the um, the National Party was quite was quite effective in expanding um, in expanding the the uh, the sort of big assets, the national road work um, uh, network, the power stations, and that sort of thing. That's uh, that sort of started to grind to a halt in the 1980s as you know the country started to uh, uh, to go into the um, uh, into its into its major crisis there, and it was never really uh, never really picked up subsequently. Um, Post nineteen ninety four, the uh, focus of, of of government efforts was essentially in um, in directing consumption, so the rollout of social grants and whatever. Now it was a choice choice they made, um, but the uh, reintegration of South Africa into the um, into the world, for instance, um, you know would have would have opened up a a whole new um, a new requirement for, for 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 port and rail infrastructure that was never really uh, really dealt with um i remember around the time of the of the the, the olympics um, the world economic forum was talking about how this was an opportunity to upgrade that infrastructure that's been allowed to be allowed to, to, to decay and then also transnet was named in some of the the state capture 
And I think you know when your eyes are on how you can um, uh, how you can pass uh, pass money off. Looking at a long term, difficult, and probably relatively low profit thing like expanding a um, uh, like expanding a port. Well, you're talking billions and billions of rands that you need, but probably not seeing a return for a long time. It's it just it just you know really didn't uh, didn't register. So priorities all backwards. Um, although I, I must say maybe there's a bit of bit of silver lining because because Minister Patel has made it quite quite clear that South Africa is going to be operating a siege economy from now on, so we won't actually need to uh, uh, need that port space anymore. So maybe we'll, we'll, we're we're fine. <laughs> yes, it does seem that way sometimes. Um, it does. It's always kind of struck me that the ANC believes that it can uh, ensure investment not by changing any policies, improving infrastructure, or anything like that, but simply by giving everyone a uh, Mandela bobblehead and a South African flag at the World Economic Forum, and then say, "Come and invest. We so our country's so beautiful." Uh, I actually, um, <laughs> I heard today on the radio. I haven't seen an article about it yet, but uh, Tito Mboweni apparently came out and said the expropriation bill is a bad idea because uh, it will discourage investments in South Africa. Not because taking away property from people without paying for it is a bad idea, because uh, it will create policy uncertainty in South Africa. But that's also <laughs> complete, but that's complete rubbish because if we decide expropriation without compensation is com it's policy now, it's not going to change, there's policy certainty. But people will not invest in South Africa. You can have as much policy certainty as you want, but you need to have good policies. Policy certainty by itself means absolutely nothing. North Korea has policy certainty, but I'm sure people aren't rushing to invest there. You know, Cuba has policy certainty, but people don't want to go there. You need to have policies that encourage investment and, you know, where people can see a return on their money. And as well, you say, you're a bad policy. You, know, you, you, can't, you can't put up photos of the Big Five and Nelson Mandela and expect people to, you know, rush to Tito Boeni with, the, you know, big checks and saying, yeah, we go. He has one billion rand to put in wherever, like to build another uh, plant in the uh, in the Eastern Cape or something. Right. Uh, you know, you should probably get the electricity working first. So we had yeah, exactly. a lot of night. Um, yeah. So I think let me be charitable to uh, finance ministers to Mboweni. And I think you can interpret. So a, a law like EWC creates policy uncertainty, even if it is certainly the policy because it provides so much discretionary power yeah. to various government officials and government organizations that you cannot predict ahead of time what's going to happen to your investment because the municipality could be like well you know this piece of land that you've been building a mine on for three years yeah. and are about to open we've just realized that it needs to be given to a black industrialist who unrelated happens <laughs> to be my cousin um, <laughs> and that uh, this is the way that we're going to uh, do economic transformation and land justice in south africa and then suddenly your investment is gone and you know that sort of stuff would pretty much be allowed under the expropriation without compensation law um anyway uh, terence uh, any more thoughts on this um uh, do you think that that mania is correct? I mean, I think there's a there's a belief in DA circles that the government is purposely um, ignoring the Cape Town port because it wants to hurt the Western Cape economy. Do you think there's any justification to a thought like that, or or is that just paranoid? You know, I um, I suppose my my instinctive response is that it's probably paranoid, but you you, you never know. Um, I think that no, look, you know, I think I think I think this is this is this is the problem with observing South African politics. That, as I say, you have you have to go through a particular looking glass, which is to say, um, this doesn't make rational sense. But is it possible that it could be happening anyway? So, um, you know, while I'm not going to while while, while I'm not going to come out uh, in agreement, I, I can't I can't write it off. Yeah. No. Anyway, I think that is all the time we have for this episode. So thank you very much for watching uh, and for listening. And we hope that you enjoyed the show. Um, I think we were all just a bit fed up today with, uh, you know, how how the universe is going. Um, <laughs> so we decided to pile in on, on all the nonsense. But uh, anyway, if you'd like to support us, if you'd like to keep the Daily Friend and the IRR going and able to fight for these things and fight the battle of ideas and spread these these, these dire warnings, the sort of be the Cassandra here, I suppose. Cassandra's the right figure? I think so. Um, please SMS your name to 32823, and we will call you back to sign you up as a friend of the Institute. Or I'll 
lastly, you can go to uh, irr.org.za slash join, click the button there and uh, sign up to become a friend of this institute. Anyway, thank you. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And yeah, keep that flag of liberty flying. Thank you.